before our pastor comes with the word, we'll have a, a, a wonderful dance by our dance ministry. But I've just been informed we have a special treat. KJ and Deshaun are going to do a Easter wrap for us. Don't be trying to act shy today. He said he got to get ready first. Hold on. Technology. Technology. And. Okay. There's one part we may not be able to understand because it's fast. So we're just going to listen really, really hard. No Easter Sunday started one day when God sent the Son to die for us. Man, that's something. Easter is the sign of God's resurrection. He died to give us all of our protection. Now we need, uh, now we think and love Him and show Him our affection. Man, Jesus taught us an important lesson. Yeah. The resurrection of the Son of God is Easter, and we just need some people just to be some believers. I thank the Lord and ask some to forgive my sin. I pray every day just to get closer to Him. In Old Testament, Genesis 1:26, I'm telling this. God created earth and heaven and every other element. Don't believe what I'm saying, man. Well, you better guess again. Mm. He's protecting his kids, even crooks. Let's give a moment silence for the kids at Sandy Hook. In the Bible, I swear to you, it's not a book. It's your lifetime, God, to let you know what you should do. The Bible is your sword. God is your seal. The Holy Ghost is the core that keeps you here to heal. So that's all I got to say. So don't forget that if you do something, it's something you will never regret. <laughs>
Father, your spirit is in this place. Jesus, you've won the victory. We thank you because you've died for our sins. We bless your name in this place and we thank you for who you are. God, we thank you for looking beyond our faults and seeing our need for you. Even when we thought that we were all right, you knew that we were in need of a savior. Even when we thought that we were okay, you knew that we were in need of a savior. So we thank you for sending Jesus. We thank you for sending Jesus to atone for our sins. Where would we be without the blood of Jesus? Where would our lives be right now without the blood of Jesus? We'd walk around with no purpose, no destiny, wondering. But because of Jesus, we have new life. And life that more abundantly. God, we thank you for who you are in this place and who you are in our lives. And we bless your name right now. God, we lift up each and every person that's in this place. Coming from all walks of life. But we've all come for one purpose. And that's to lift up the name of Jesus. We've all come to hear a word from you. So God, we remove any distraction. Anything that would hinder us from hearing the word. And we ask that you empower us on this day. And now, God, give me everything that I need to preach and to teach your word. And now let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, he is my strength, and I believe him to be your strength. He is my redeemer, and I know him to be your redeemer. Let the people of God in this place say amen. Amen. Can we give God some praise in this place? While you're still standing. While you're still standing in your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, let's go to Titus. If you can bring me down some, please. Titus chapter 2. Anybody excited about Jesus in this place? Amen. Praise God for who he is, for the visitors that are in this place. God bless you. Amen. To the members of Wissick, the wonderful members of Wissick, God bless you. Amen. Titus chapter 2, beginning in verse 11. I think I can come down a little more. And we're going to read through to chapter 3, verse 7. And I'm going to deal with some doctrine today. Is that all right? To read doctrine is sometimes boring, but we're going to make it fun today. Amen? <laughs> Titus 2, beginning the 11th verse, and we're going to read to 3. And does anybody need a Bible? We have some in the back. If you slip up your hands, we'll give you one. I see you up here in the front. Titus 2, beginning 11 verse. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself 
a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. I said he redeemed us from all wickedness so that we could do what is good. These then are the things you should teach, encourage, and rebuke with all authority. Do not let anyone despise you. Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle towards everyone. At one time, we, were, we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us, not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth, that's regeneration, and the renewal by the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. And for a few moments this morning, I want to speak from the title, Life After Death. Life After Death. You can take your seat. If you're a visitor here and you have not received a visitor's card, please make sure you slip up your hand so that someone can give you one, please. Ushers, you see that? Anybody praying this morning? Amen. Life after death. Everyone in this room has been given a second chance at some point in their life. And to be honest, we would not be where we are had it not been for someone giving us a second chance. What makes a second chance so important to us is that there is the realization that our first time around wasn't what it should have been. But now here's another opportunity to make things right. We have said, if I could just go back in time, if I could just do it all over again, if I could just have a fresh start, I won't make the same mistakes that I made before. I think everybody said that. Some of us have declared, I promise, as God is my witness, this time things will be different in my life. Others have said, I swear on the Bible. Some of us have said, I swear on my mama's grave, this time around, I'm going to get it right, for real, for real. And we make these statements because we understand it's not so much about the second chance as it is what we do with the second chance that counts. Because the reality is that many of us are on our third, fourth, fifth, and even 105th chance. Because what we thought we would never do, we still do. What we thought had died in us is still living. The mindset we had before the second chance is still the same mindset that we have now. So the decisions we make haven't changed. In fact, we haven't really moved forward from where we are during the time we were searching and hoping for another shot at life. And now life almost seems impossible to live. Now we must understand, first of all, that just living by itself is rough. Can I get an amen in the building? Many of us get up each day to the difficulties of our jobs, circumstances that have negatively impacted our homes. We wake up to division in our marriages and family dynamics and just trying to push through without any drive or motivation to get stuff done. But what makes life a hopeless situation where you never seem to see the upside of down or think that it can only get worse and not better is a life without knowing Jesus. Because at least when you know Jesus and the eyes of your understanding have been enlightened, you begin to know what is the hope of his calling. You begin to know what are the riches of his inheritance in the saints. And you begin to know what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us that believe. 
So guess what that means? Your days don't always have to be brighter for you to feel better because you realize that God can get the best out of you because he gave you the best in Jesus. And this second chance you have at a life is not run by an old mindset, but it's ruled by the Holy Spirit that has given you dominion and authority to be everything God has called you to be and also stop the enemy's plan that seeks to set you back. Now you must realize that the dominion we have comes with a price. Our new life comes with a price. Jesus had to die that we might live. And God, by his power, raised him from the dead after he conquered sin and death and seated him in heavenly places above all principalities over all rule and dominion. And now when we die to our old nature... What's our old nature? The lust of the flesh and the lust of the mind. By accepting the salvific work of Christ on the cross, we are also raised to sit in heavenly places. So now that we sit with Christ, we don't sin with the world. We are in the world, but we're not of the world. And the life we now live, the second chance that we have, we give it unto the glory of God. Why? Because we want to see his purposes fulfilled in our life. I like it quiet as long as y'all listening. So now what I'm saying is that your second chance or your new life, if you will, only comes after you've died first. And it's through that death that your second chance has greater possibility than your first chance. Because what you couldn't do without the strength and help from God is nothing more than one power move away. What I mean by this is that every time temptation comes to turn you back the other direction, you just release some power. When your mind is telling you no and your body is telling you yes, you just release some power. And you release power. This is how every time you reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to Christ. Because it's the resistance of the devil that brings out the strength of God. So you take control over your environment and you declare that my latter days will be better than my former days because this life that I have after death has been given to me for one reason and that's to walk in the will of God for my life. I'm going to preach a little bit. So if it means I got to pray at the top of my lungs in the midst of a trial, And praise till I can't move a muscle when the obstacle is before me. One thing I know, I said one thing I know is that the best in me is one victory away. Before the death, I threw a pity party. (laughs) But now after death, I got a power play that ensures that I always win. And that play comes from being a recipient of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know why? Because there's power. There's power, wonder working power. And guess where it's at? It's in the blood. So you know what? Thank God for the blood that brought you life. Why? Because it's because of the blood that you can command your body to be healed. It's because of the blood that you can command your marriage to remain whole. It's because of the blood that you can set your mind on things that are above. It's because of the blood that you can tell the devil that he's got to get out of your life because this old life is gone and there's no match for a blood washed child of God. Thank you. Now that we understand that life comes after death, I got to give you three things. I'm not a long-winded preacher. Y'all know me, right? Three things that Jesus did by dying on the cross to help us live this life after death. Look at your neighbor and say three things. Right here in the text, chapter 2, verse 14 says this. He redeemed us. Somebody say he redeemed us. This is just some plain Jane doctrine. What I like about redemption is that God is so loving and merciful that he knew we needed to be redeemed more than we did. And he made a decision that he was going to do something about it. Y'all ought to give God some praise. He, He didn't just see it, but he said, I got to do something about this. You know why? Because we actually thought that we were okay in this life. But if we were fine, there would not have been a need for him to release, liberate, or deliver us. I say that we were fine. A person doesn't need to be rescued if they're already free. But the Bible declares in Hebrews 2.15 that Christ came and died to deliver all those through fear of death 
were subject to lifelong bondage. Look at your neighbor and say, I was in bondage. Yes, you were. And if we can be honest, that's everyone in this room. We try to walk around and declare that we're free because we do what we want when we want. But 1 John 5, 19 says that the whole world is in the power of the evil one. I'm writing scripture, PJ. In other words, without Christ, you're nothing more than a prisoner who acts like they're free. But it's still inside the fence. Inside the fence. A person that has convinced themselves that they're innocent but you can tell how they live that the guilt of sin, both known and unknown, has kept them in the chains of the world. I got you thinking, I know. But what I love about God is that he thinks so highly of us that he pays the ransom to bring us out of darkness and transfer us to the kingdom of light. But watch this. He doesn't look for a cheap way to do it. <laughs> that should have quickened you right there. He paid the ransom but he didn't look for the cheapest way in which he can do it. Now, y'all know something about some deals and some sales. I say he didn't look for the cheapest way to do it because normally when a person has to pay a ransom, they search for the way that lessens the overall effect on them while still appeasing the one demanding the ransom. Why? Because you don't want it to affect you too much. You want what you want, but you don't want to have to give that much to give it. They assess the situation and look to do the bare minimum and hope that their price will be accepted. But God, who is rich in mercy and loves us so much, said that I've got to provide something that can't be refused, something that will cover everyone, something that's of the ultimate value and whom I only have one of, which makes him priceless. He says, I've got to send a perfect savior with no flaws, who can complete this transaction once and for all. And once it's paid, there will never have to be another price to be paid. Oh, I'm preaching it to you. This means that neither the world nor the super Christians of the faith can make you or I pay again for what Christ already paid for because they don't see your life changing fast enough. Because you all of a sudden don't look holy enough or you're not where they feel that you should be. They ain't got a heaven or a hell to put you in. Instead of spending so much time praying on you, they need to spend more time praying for you and realize that we are all a product of redemption and we are fighting each day to walk in our liberty in Christ Jesus. I just felt a quickening in my spirit. Because when you understand who paid the price, why he did it, and how he did it, over time, you learn how to lay down on your own. You don't need the world and the super saints to push you down. You learn how to lay down on your own. You learn how to beat down your own flesh. I don't need nobody else to beat me up because when I understand what he did, why he did it, and how he did it, I don't mind beating down my flesh every once in a while if the pain is going to bring out the power of God in my life. I just started preaching. When you understand it, you realize what it means to carry your cross daily. And you will come to the conclusion if that this is what it took for Jesus to give me life. Then this is what it's going to take for me to continue in this life because this is one transfer that cannot be undone. You spent your life trying to fill a space that God kept empty. Hear me. I said, you spend your life trying to fill a space that God kept. <laughs> this going to mess with you. He kept it empty purposely because it was reserved for him. And now with this second chance and with this new life that you have, you've got to act like you've been redeemed so that you can live without guilt, but instead walk in boldness. And when you get weak, you can come boldly where to the throne of grace where you can find mercy and grace to help in the time of need. Somebody holler. I need some help. You know why you can do that? Because you've been redeemed. Look at somebody say, I've been redeemed. Number two, I'm quick. I'm quick. Chapter three, verse five. It says that 
he regenerated us. He redeemed us, but he regenerated us. Now, regeneration, unlike redemption or some of the other tenets of the faith, is totally a work of God in which we play no active part. Regeneration can be defined as a new birth or recreation. We did not know that we would be born, nor did we ask to be born, but it was God's will and purpose that we were born. Make sense? So well, in regeneration, we did not ask to be born again, nor could we control being born again, but it was what God did or does, you know why? Just because he's God. So now the first birth we experienced was unto our earthly parents. But our parents are born of the first Adam and which sin into the world. And because of that, we are more sin and devil conscious. But the second birth we experience is unto our heavenly father in which we are born of the bloodline of the second Adam, which is Jesus, which makes us more God conscious. I'm giving you the doctrine this morning. That's the best I got. So you ain't got to shout. <laughs> this is how Romans 5, 12 through 17 puts it. It says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned, to be sure sin was in the world before the law was given. But sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass. I'm loving Jesus. For if the many died by the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many? Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But here we go. But the gift followed many trespass and brought justification, which means you are now in right standing. For if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more would those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? You had a first birth, and now you get a second birth. So now in order for us to reign in life, God had to regenerate us, or we had to be reborn again. Are you understanding this? Through our earthly parents, we are born of water and birthed in the likeness of our parents. Well, in Christ, we are also born of water, but it is the washing of water by the word. Listen now. So it is through the word that we are washed in which faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Somebody going to get saved. And by faith, after hearing and accepting God's word, we receive salvation in which now we are a seed of the bloodline of Christ and by his spirit and the work of God, we are birthed again or regenerated as a new creature in Christ Jesus. Did I break it way down? Somebody, somebody got to hear it. Now, this is important for life after death, because for you to be reborn in Christ means that you have been restored to your original state in him. That ought to make you happy, which is why he has no problem seating you with him in heavenly places. And he sets you there so that you would realize who you live for while you can look down at what you used to live to. I'm preaching up in this piece. They don't want to get it, Joe. They don't want to get it. So now as you live for Christ, you find that you have some traits within you that you didn't have in your first birth. You used to think like your earthly parents, but now you have, the Bible says, the mind of Christ. You used to walk like the world, but now your steps are ordered by the Lord. You used to talk like the world, but now that God's word is hidden in your heart, every time you open your mouth, you begin to declare the commands and decrees of God everywhere you go, and you are successful in this life. You know why? Because now you know who you really are. Oh, I just told you something. I just let you know that you was living a lie before Christ. Now in Christ, you know who you really are. And now your understanding of who you live for 
is directly attributed to the awakening of spiritual life within you. So now true living for you is only reality when you walk in the spirit because you do not want to fulfill the lust of the flesh. You know why? Because living people don't handle dead things. Oh, that was too deep for y'all. Y'all better wake up. Y'all going to eat in a minute. I said living people don't handle dead things. So guess what? You got to leave those dead relationships alone in your new life. You got to leave those dead decisions alone. You got to leave those dead characteristics, because I don't want to see them, alone. You got to leave those dead mindsets alone alone and then you got to go on living Christ didn't need his grave clothes when he arose from the dead and neither do you oh that was just too much for you to handle Christ ain't need no grave clothes no clothes that were the residue of the sin that he bore in his body when he went on to glory he didn't need his grave clothes so neither do you so now you got to roll the stone back over your old life and you got to not look back. Why? Because if any man be in Christ, he or she is a new creature. The old has passed. The new has come. I said the old has passed. The new has come. Tell somebody it's time to live. Y'all ready to eat? It's all right. Say yes. Don't, I don't like when people fake. Y'all ready to eat? Somebody say point three. Let's get out of here. I don't like when people tell stories. I don't like that. Mm -mm. But lastly, this is found in chapter 3, verse 5. He not only redeems us, he not only regenerates us, but he renews us. <laughs> I said he renews us. Lastly, God renews us by his spirit. He makes renovations in us so that we look like and act like the one whom we've been born of. Could you imagine having a baby that's got your blood and lives in your house but looks like your next door neighbor? That's how they be laughing at you. I'm a believer, but you look like your next door neighbor. I ain't gonna say his name. Redemption brings us to God. Regeneration births us in God. But renewal brings the God out of us. Ooh, that's some good preaching right there. The three R's. And it's the God exuding from us that validates the power of his death and resurrection in us. But see, renovation doesn't come without a fight. Because why God wants to take some stuff, all of us want to keep some stuff. We all see it in our own lives. A person will get a new house with a new concept, but hang on to the old stuff. Come on, first lady. I felt something. <laughs> they would rather keep what's old, what's broken, and what they don't need. And the excuse is that they might need it at some point. It's old, it's broken, has no use. But the excuse is you might need it. <laughs> Y'all too holy for me. I might need it at some point, but it's broke. You ain't fixed it yet. <laughs> but I might need it at some point. They say things like the stuff they keep has memories attached to it, <laughs> both good and bad. <laughs> and some of it served a purpose at some point in time, but now it's not useful, it's not relevant, and it's taken up space that the new stuff needs to occupy. I'm, I'm in your Kool-Aid because I know the flavor. He told me the flavor of your Kool-Aid. Look at your neighbor and say, take a sip, take a sip. I don't know why I told you to say that. That ain't spiritual. <laughs> Pay attention to me. And the reality is that the new house, watch me now, never really reflects 
what it could be while the old stuff is still there. Woo! Somebody say, Pastor, you're preaching. <laughs> it's not a question of whether the house is really new because you see the work, but what it's filled with is inconsistent with the rest of the house. And rather than embracing the truth that the old stuff doesn't fit with the new, watch me now, you argue a lie about what belongs in the house just to save face and someone has to try to coerce you to let that mess go. Whose street I come down? It's all right. I'm driving a Pinto too and I'm still pimping it in Jesus name. See, it's not a question about whether you are new or if you have a new life. But many times what we are filled with is inconsistent with the totality of who we are. Talking about the new life, Greg. We lie to ourselves and to others because we're prideful and don't want it to appear that we're not delivered from everything. But first you need to realize that there is no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. And secondly, God is so smart and God is so wise, he gave you the Holy Spirit and the Bible calls him the helper because you're behind and my behind, we just need some help. Yeah, y'all too holy, I need some help. I ain't got it together. I think I sinned this week. Who sinned here this week? Raise, oh, everybody don't want to raise their hand? Mm. I feel a spirit of exposure in the room. I see somebody. I'm going to start pointing to folks. And now what I like about the Holy Spirit, watch this, is that he is bold enough and powerful enough to not only tell you the truth about what you're hanging on to, that's one side of him, but he can move you to a place of taking authority in your life where you stop making excuses and you start removing the broken stuff and taking out the damaged goods and stop trying to find a purpose in stuff that you used to do when you were in the world and start creating space so that the fruit of God can be manifested in your life. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And the Holy Spirit comes with new life. I got a good class. I don't need any tutors. Because the problem with your life before death is that you looked good on the outside because you could dress it up with makeup. <laughs> you could dress it up with a good career. You can even try to dress it up with a, with a PhD. You could try to dress it up if you're talent, if you will. But you were a mess on the inside. But life after death says you can look just as good on the inside <laughs> as you do on the outside. And in fact, the renovations on the inside are going to make you look better on the outside than you ever have because renovation brings out transformation. Well, I'm preaching the doctrine today. Paul says it this way in Romans 12 and 2. Y'all know it by heart. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing, which I say is renovation, of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And see, this is the place we want to be in our new life. It's a life of continual transformation that lives out or is an example of God's good, pleasing, and perfect will. And it's only in his perfect will that the worst of your life becomes the best life you've ever lived. Jesus didn't die. He didn't just die, but he got up. I said Jesus didn't just die, but he got up. You didn't just die in Christ, but you actually got up. So if you got up, you don't have to still live like you're dead because you realize that there's life after death. And when you get up, you leave hell right where it is, 
behind you and you look unto Jesus, who the Bible says is the author and the finisher of your faith. You know why? Because you've been redeemed, you've been regenerated, you've been renewed, and the only thing that you got to do now is run. You got a second chance. That's what you wanted. Now what you got to do is run. You didn't know your purpose. Now you can see it. You got to run. You weren't certain of your destiny, but now you know it. You got to run. You can run now because the life of God is in you. Let me tell you something. The life without God is a life of weariness. There's a song that says, Lord, I'm not tired yet. That's believers singing that song. There's a life that's before Christ that really isn't living at all. And where you just get tired, you get drained, you live in guilt, you live in shame, though you try to act like it's all together. Come on, I'm with you. We're all there. We try to dress up our guilt with going harder and doing more of this and being out this way and being extroverted that way. We try to put on the front. But the reason why you go so hard is because you're guilty. And you go hard when you're outside the house, but when you go back in the house, you're tired. But guess what? You can't hold that in but so long. Now your friends see the weariness. Family members see the weariness. But it's something about when the Holy Spirit quickens you after you've said yes to God. You get tired from the toils and the temptations and the things going on in this earth. But I thank God for the grace that fills you up and gives you the strength that you don't have when you're tired, then you can sing the song, Lord, I'm not tired yet. It's not that you don't look tired sometimes, but with your new life, you can say, I'm not tired yet because I ain't dead no more. I got life after death. So I got to press and I got to push towards the mark of the high calling that is in Christ Jesus because there's something waiting in front of me. I can't go back. I got life after death. Let me help you. If you've received Jesus Christ, you have this life, whether it's visible or not. I just want to help some people out with that. Because Christians can be so cruel. Yeah, I'm on your street too. The world is already cruel. You ain't there yet. I'm telling you, whether others see it or not, if you receive Christ, you have a new life. But if you haven't received Christ, you're dead. But you need to die with Christ if you want to live again. It is humiliating to die for Christ. Extremely humiliating. You don't look cool dying. <laughs> you don't look cool. You'll lose some folks along the way. Dying causes you to get persecuted. <laughs> but it's worth it for the life. And I know we sing songs about when we all get to heaven what a day of rejoicing that will be. But eternal life starts here. You ain't got to wait to get to heaven to rejoice. I can rejoice right now because Jesus lives. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Oh, <laughs> somebody need to sing a stanza of that. I don't know who. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. In your old life, you didn't want to face tomorrow even though you came out. But because he lives, every one of us can face tomorrow. There's life after death. Jesus Christ died so that you would live. So now if you haven't received Christ, you have to die so that you can live. 
all heads bowed and eyes closed. God, you are awesome in this place. We reverence your name. Your spirit is here. Your power is here. God, you know who needs you. It's not about dressing up, coming to a Resurrection Sunday service. But it's about saying on this day, I want to make a decision to make Jesus my Lord and my Savior. Maybe you're here today and you're saying, I just came because I was asked to come. I want to see God do some great things in my life, but I don't know God like that. I see myself progressing in him. But I've never opened up my mouth and declare Jesus to be my Savior. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth Jesus Christ, so there's a mouth confession, but God is looking at your heart. It says if you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Maybe you're sitting here today and you're saying, I didn't know that's all it took. That's actually something that I believe. That's actually something that I understand. That's something that I want. And you're in this place today and you're saying, I need to receive Christ as my Lord and Savior. Regardless of who's in this room, all eyes closed and praying in the room. Make your way up to the front and say, I want to receive Jesus today. It's all about God and you. Make it personal. Jesus died for you. For your sins to give you a new life. If you know you need Jesus Christ on today, just make your way up to the front. You can even slip up your hand if you know you need to receive Jesus. Maybe you're saying, I know him, but I still live like I have my death clothes on. And I'm messing this new life up. And I want to live the way that God wants me to live. I want to be in his will and his, in his way that's you today come forward and slip your hands up so somebody that's can pray for you the, the power of God is being released in this room he's here to change mindsets he died to redeem you he wants to regenerate you he wants to renew you that's not how maybe you just need general prayer prayer for your marriage prayer for healing in your body prayer for children you want to intercede for a friend or for a loved one the altar is open for you There's nothing mystical about this altar, but it's just a step of faith for you. If you know you need to walk down here, just walk down. God, we decrease pride and egos in this room. Any feelings of shame. We call on confidence and boldness in the room. In the name of Jesus. Oh, 
they hung him high. Hung him high. They stretched him wide. He hung his head. Hung his head. For me, died. That's love. That's love. Oh, they hung him high. 